this is w Wigton Book Festival Book Club. But we're very sorry, we may not be able to just run it exactly like a normal book club for the simple reason that we're a wee bit of victims of our own success. And rather a lot of people are joining us this evening. So whilst everybody's coming in, I'm just going to have a bit of chat with you. Um, I usually chair events at Wigton Book Festival um, occasionally, mostly countryside events, animals, birds, wildlife things. I'm Polly Puller, by the way, I'm also a writer. And tonight is Patrick Laurie's event on his wonderful book, Native, Life in a Vanishing Landscape. Um, I read this already twice and I'm halfway through it for a third time. And the reason for that is because I absolutely adore this book. It's absolutely incredible. It has really made a very, very big impression on me. It's incredibly moving and it's just, Patrick's got a lot to say and his text is just lyrical and beautiful and it paints Galloway as it really is. Um, and the saddest part about it is that even since he wrote it, about 18 months to two years ago, things have changed. So the book is really very, very important. It's a piece of very important social history. Anyway, I hope we're going to settle down because this is going to be your event tonight. You're going to be able to post your questions. Um, the best way to do that is for you to use the chat facility, which is at the bottom of your screen on the right hand side, the third button along from the right. And if you press onto that, you can type your questions for Patrick. And then we're going to pick out the various questions and he's going to hopefully be able to answer them. If you haven't read the book, I think that you will be able to follow because a lot of the topics that he talks about or we're going to raise tonight are very, very um, emotive at the current time. And so we don't really know how it's going to work. It could all go belly up, especially as both Patrick and I are in um, very rural locations. I'm in Highland Perthshire, where it's absolutely beautiful sunshine tonight. And Patrick, of course, is in Galloway. And our internet broadband is a little bit erratic. So if things start to go a little bit wobbly, um, we do uh, apologize for that and hope that we'll be able to pick up again. So be patient with us and uh, we really hope to have a bit of fun. It's not a deadly serious event. It's not like a normal book festival um, author event. This is something going to be a little bit different, I hope. And I hope you're all going to enjoy it very much. Now, I see Patrick is there now. So I think it would be great if we just start having a wee chat with Patrick. Hopefully everyone's got their drink ready and um, things are going to kick off. Hello, Patrick. Are you there? <laughs> how are you, Polly? Hello, how are you? Yes, are you um, in sunshine too in Galloway? Absolutely fantastic sunshine. We've had nothing but incredible bright, um, fantastic conditions for the last yeah three weeks. But it's getting quite dry now and getting quite powdery. We could do with a bit of rain. Um, yeah, I know. It's exactly the same here. Have you been having ground frost first thing in the morning too? Absolutely, yeah. Um, but only for the first 20 minutes, first half hour of daylight, and then it's, then it's all gone. And then we're back to... So you've to, been up very early. Have you, on your black cock legs, you've been out well, early? You? I've been, so I'm working on a piece of ground where there's black grouse. Um, it means it's my excuse to, 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 to defy the, uh, the, the lockdown. If I'm there anyway, it just so happens that I can go a couple of hours earlier and make an earlier start than I normally would be making. But uh, black grouse have been doing... Well, they're doing really badly in Galloway at the moment, but they're, they are there and they have been displaying the last few days. So it's been really worth the, worth the sort of half past four in the morning start. Um, is the leg a bit late this year? Is it later than usual? I think it's late this year. Um, we usually, you usually expect to see it peaking sort of this week and we're really now only seeing things starting to kick off and really get going now. So, um, but then it's weird. A lot of the rules that apply for black grouse in other parts of the country don't apply here because we've got so few black grouse they're basically trying to make ends meet and it's not easy for them so most of the rule book um behaviors that you'd expect to see elsewhere just don't apply here um i was um in touch with somebody earlier today um explaining or trying to explain a couple of things that i've seen happening recently uh and yeah basically he said that's just that's just weird they're up to some weird stuff but they're trying to cover huge pieces of ground um they're trying to they're trying to find mates and get set up for the year and actually there's very few other birds for them to hang out with so yeah, they're being driven to do some strange things, which is in some ways very sad, but in other ways it just shows they've got a bit of a bit of initiative. 
Well, that's very good. It's a bit like being a, a man in a rural environment. You've got to go out and look for a partner, haven't you? It's not always yeah. that easy. If you, you know, sit around, nothing happens, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what have you else been doing today? How are the beasties? Have you been out with the cattle today? Yeah, so I've got um, cattle that are going out onto the hill, uh, ideally in a week's time. Um, so I've got to get them. They've all been in different places over the winter, and it helps if they're going to be part of a gang and they all know each other and they've got a bit of a herd dynamic going. So I've been putting together cattle that don't know each other very well and trying to get them to sort of come to a bit of agreement with each other. Um, which has been quite fun. They've been, there's been a lot of shoving and fighting and pushing about, and some of them have gone off in a sulk. And, um, but I hope by the time we get to uh, 1st of May is when I'm trying to get them out there, um, hopefully they'll have settled down and they'll be a bit more of a team and they'll be able to, to know each other and work together. And I don't end up um, with cattle that effectively you open the gate and they'll just vanish off in different directions. They'll, all, they'll know each other a bit better. So this is a and you're of... about to start carving fairly soon, aren't you? Yeah, so carving starts in a fortnight. Um, the slight frustration of today has been that I've spent the last month making a, a horn-handled crook, um, which has been a real labour of love. I've spent hours sanding, dusting, oiling, straightening this hazel shank and putting an African blackwood collar on it and getting it all absolutely sorted. And the first opportunity I had to work with it today, the, the thing's broken. Um, so that set me back. I was, I was pretty livid um, when that came to be. But um, I suppose probably I've designed an ornament rather than a functional piece of kit, so I'm probably paying the price for that. No, well, you're probably, the next one will probably be better. So right, the I book, um, Patrick, I think you know already that I'm, I think it's the finest nature book I've read for a very long time. I call it a nature book, and that's actually quite a broad title for it, because in fact it encompasses so many things. Um, like most authors, you're, you're very hesitant and um, self-denigrating at this stage, you know, and it's so unfortunate for you that um, book launches and festival events are all off. But I think this is a book that's going to fly, whatever. It is just absolutely enchanting, passionate. It's got everything in it. It's, it's just so multifaceted. Um, are you beginning to feel a little bit more confident about it now? Or is that a silly question? No, it's... it's... It's funny, I was very happy with it when it was written, um, and that was then 18 months ago. Um, everything has changed. Uh, there's nothing, pretty much nothing still standing in terms of what I'm trying to do with the farm. Everything's moved on from there now. So uh, I suppose a little bit insecure about putting out something that was written so long ago. Um, and also, too, I've had pretty much no reception, no feedback, no idea really how it's going. So I've had a couple of scraps and bits and pieces, um, but but really I've got, yeah, I'm working in the dark a little bit. I just have to sit with fingers crossed and hope that people like it, really. I think they will. I think it's, um, and the fact that you're such a, you know, countryman born and bred, it really shows all the time. It's not a, just a romantic um, story. It's absolutely incredible. Now, I'm hoping that some people are going to have some questions soon. And as we explained at the beginning, I tried to explain at the beginning, if you use the chat facility and type in your question um, we can start taking some questions and involving people in the audience it would be really super if we could start to see some of these questions and then we can single out some for you to answer is um, everybody anybody about to type something for us no, not too much coming in just yet, but that'll hopefully happen. In the meantime, I want to ask you more about the situation with your curlews. Are, are there some curlews on your farm at the moment or not? This has been a funny year, actually, for mm -hmm. curlews. Um, what with it being so dry and curlews needing damp, soggy, boggy conditions, um, they all arrived with a great drum roll and fanfare about a month ago. Um, and then most of them have just gone away again, um, which I suppose isn't doesn't really give much of a picture. On a part of a general 10-year trend, we've seen a huge, huge decline in curlews on the pieces of ground where I work. Um, we've gone from eight, nine, ten pairs 10 years ago down to two and a bit, really. Um, this spring, I mean, they're sort of inbuilt. They've got fail-safe mechanisms. They live so long that in a year like this, they can take a look around and say, nah, it's not really worth it, and go back to the sea. And then they'll um, maybe try again in a better year. Um, they've got that kind of huge longevity that means they can just, they can, they can um, basically draw stumps and, and try again. Whereas birds that work on a faster turnaround, like lapwings, um, they really need every year to count. Um, and so um, we've had curlews displaying here at the, at the farm the last few days, but very little compared to what we'd normally see. And I suppose that's much more to do with the season than, 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 than part of the general decline. 
Um, but everywhere you go, this is one of the, the, the misleading things about curlews is you talk about curlews and try and get people tuned into the idea that they're declining so quickly. And people say, well, I see them. They're, they're all over the place. Um, and particularly on the Solway, uh, the, the Galloway Solway, um, curlews are very common, particularly in the winter. You see hundreds of curlews. Um, the, I think probably the slightly misleading thing is that we get a lot of migrant curlews, um, which come to this country from Finland and Russia, and they come for the winter, and then they go back to Finland and Russia in the spring. So actually all the birds that we see until about February um, aren't our birds. And the problem, the real telling thing now is how many birds do you actually see out and about and around you when you're in the countryside? And I think actually, I'm just going to interrupt you there because there's a question here from somebody who says, what are curlies? So I think we need to clear that up. So yeah. curlews. So can you just quickly explain to people what curlews are? We were carrying. I was carrying on as if everybody knew, but of course that's why should they? So curlews are way. And that's one of the things too that I was quite keen to put in uh, the book was actually to try and bring everybody along by trying to explain essentially what a curlew is. Because while I assume everybody knows, because they're a really important part of of this place and, and my surroundings, a lot of people don't know. Um, they are, I don't know why people always say when they're asked to describe curlews, they always say, well, they're the biggest British wader. Uh, yeah, they're the biggest British wader, but that's probably not a very helpful um, description. They're a moderately small sized brown speckly bird with a down curved beak. Um, they've got a white ass and they stand uh, probably about the size of, uh, uh, yeah, probably the height of a pheasant, but about the body volume of a, of a, of a bantam or a much smaller bird. So they're very bony, very um yeah they're very skinny very sort of gaunt birds but actually they look a lot bigger than they really are when you get one in the hand um i think probably the important thing about curlews is the sound of the curlew um if you have no idea what a curlew looks like no idea what it does and and, and how it spends its time i think there's an awful lot of people who hear a curlew and they go oh i know exactly what you mean i know that um partly that's a that's partly a reason why um partly because the birds um, have a fantastic call but also it's used all the time in television and radio it's a really um it's it, it's almost overused and quite often it's frustrating for those of us who are quite nerdy and quite picky about this kind of thing they often play curlews in the background uh, <laughs> give a bit of atmosphere to, to to shots and scenes um where curlews would never be so sometimes you oh, hear curlews displaying in a forest well they'd never go in a forest but it's such a sort of a haunting exciting evocative sound um that, that I think an awful lot more people would know what a curlew is if only they could hear it. I'm, it would have been great if I could have just flicked a switch or clicked a button just now and we could all have heard it because I think there would be a... Mr. Crick, we should have done that. We've got yeah. Deb Harley here and she has said, I haven't read the book. Can you give us a general overview plus something about you as an author as well? So that's just a, a quick one there from Deb Harley. Sure. Um, I've really struggled with this, uh, even when I was first writing the book and um, interested pals were saying, what's the book about? Uh, I really struggled to give a clear answer because in some ways it's a book about farming. Some ways it's a book about conservation. Um, in some ways it's a book about Galloway and history. Uh, it's got a lot of um, folklore and, and, and sort of local stuff in there, but also it looks at the countryside more generally and actually what we expect from the countryside. Um, and actually how we've got to a place now where we're making decisions about what we want from the countryside. Uh, all of this is like huge sort of stuff and fluff around. I would love to be able to give a really succinct answer and just say, that's exactly what the book's about. But I think without wanting to push the book, I think you kind of got to read it because it ended up initially my first, I was looking at it earlier, some early drafts. It was called the Curlew book. When I first, when I first sat down to, to, to do some drafts and do some work on it, it was called the Curlew book. Uh, and it was only later I realized that it's about way more than just Curlews. And in some ways, Curlews, Curlews seem to represent an awful lot more um, about, about wider land use. Patrick, there's another comment here from Alan Smith. I'm slightly surprised that you're indicating that the launch is low key. Your book and reviews of it are everywhere. Somebody's doing a very good job on your behalf, including your brother who pointed me in the direction of Native, for which I'm very grateful as I loved it. My sister's already had a copy for a birthday, the nicest book I've read about Galloway for a while. So that's lovely. Now we've got Anne O'Connell, who is saying, um, asking if you have a view on urban foxes and how we can coexist with them. Now that's quite a long question. So I think if you can give a 
you know, as your book's not really about urban foxes? It's an interesting question. I, I always find urban foxes to be almost sort of supernatural. I, 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 the few times I've seen them in late nights in Glasgow and Edinburgh, um, it's, it, it seems to me like they're so out of place and yet actually you ask the foxes and they are so not out of place. They know fine well what they're doing and they're, they're making, making um, great. They even go to the zebra crossing. They're absolutely incredible and they'll go to the crossings and wait for the green man. I've seen them but, do it outside the concert hall in Glasgow. Yeah, incredible. no, absolutely. And it's, it's some of the best stuff I've heard from uh, about urban foxes is from taxi drivers working late hours. Um, they see all, all sorts of stuff. Um, I, I must say, I, not being a city person and not really knowing much more about urban foxes and just occasionally bumping into the odd one, um, I'm probably not really qualified to answer whether or not there are, there are perhaps they are a problem. I, I, I don't know. I'm much more, most of what I know about foxes is based on seeing them in the countryside. Um, if anybody has wants to speak to Patrick directly, please can I just remind you that you need to put your hand up and Anne um, will highlight that and send a message so that we can sort that out. Uh, somebody here is um, wanting to order a copy and they live in USA, so there you are. Oh, brilliant. Uh, we've got Michelle Werrett here who says, I love your blog posts, thank you for writing them. Over the years, your perspective seems to have changed from gamekeeper to farmer. Would you like to say something about that, please? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, I was trained as a gamekeeper originally when I left school. I had a real strong um, shooting interest. And um, I suppose probably I was drawn to gamekeeping because I felt that um, it was real hands-on conservation. It was real hands-on management of the countryside. Um, but where I am in Galloway, the kind of conservation I was interested in, you can only really do through farming. Get the, the kind of shooting we've got here and the kind of gamekeeping we've got here doesn't really tickle me in the same way as the kind of gamekeeping I originally wanted to set out to do. So I kind of had to park a lot of my um, enthusiasm for gamekeeping um, and, and actually, I must say, I wouldn't go back. Uh, I have a lot of interest and a lot of pals who are madly keen and tuned into shooting. Um, I must say, I find, I've, in a way, I find farming an awful lot more interesting. Um, and also, <laughs> it opens up some much bigger discussions about what we're doing with the countryside. Sometimes, I, um, when you look at shooting, is so incredibly seasonal and it focuses in on just a few days of the year. Um, farming is every day, all the time, bound into weather conditions bound into landscape in a in a in a really profound way that shooting just isn't so i'm still i retain all links to shooting I, i'm i'm very fond of um occasional um shooting a few birds for the pot but um it's it's part of a much bigger picture and i find it easier to access that from through farming if that makes sense um yeah, that's very interesting. I would just like to say to you here, I'd like to come to one of the questions um, that we had as a topic about how does your book... You went, Polly, I couldn't hear you. What did you say? <clears throat> how does your book balance the idea of nostalgia and progress in the countryside? Oh, um, I'm really keen not to um, be nostalgic about the countryside. Uh, I'm really keen, I was always really keen in putting the book together to produce something that um, was realistic rather than sort of rose tinted and, and all retrospective. Um, I think there's a huge amount, there's an incredibly undervalued resource in terms of rural heritage. Um, and I think that this massive deep wells of interest and intrigue around what, how we've got, how the countryside today, why the countryside today looks the way it does. Um, but at the same time, we've got to be pragmatic. I was always keen that I wasn't trying to run a, a museum piece. I was always keen to produce something that was relevant to the relevant to the modern countryside. What's really interesting, though, is over the last five, six years, um, starting out looking a little bit old fashioned, um, the way agricultural policy is going, the way subsidies are going, the way payments might be going in the future. A lot of what I'm doing now it suddenly seems an awful lot more relevant than it did a few years ago. Um, so I am on the board of the Nature Friendly Farming Network in Scotland. Um, that's really gaining traction for a start. That didn't exist uh, even a few years ago, but that's now gaining traction as, as, part, of a, as part of a wider sort of appreciation of what agriculture can do for conservation. Um, and so um, I'm really keen to make sure that 
the kind of farming I do remains relevant. I'm not, don't just completely go out on a limb as much as I would love. God, I would love more than anything to have Clydesdales and work Clydesdales, but yes, um, I, 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 for, for a start, I simply don't have the time to do that kind of work. But at the same time, um, it's really important to me that I can still have conversations with people who are, who are running probably what you describe as more commercial operations than what I'm doing to make sure that I don't just, yeah, as I say, don't just vanish into like a living museum. I'm quite keen that I, uh, that I keep in touch. Now, um, Lucy Marcus from Berlin, who's done a great job on uh, organizing events and things, she says she's keen to know how you find the time to write. You seem so busy. What's your writing routine, she's asking. That's kind yes. of difficult to ask. Um, I, I just love writing, I, so I make time for it. I force time for it. Um, sometimes I think that there are absolute sitters, real obvious stuff that I really want to write about, and, and that kind of blows away anything else I had planned for the day, I end up just doing that instead. Um, but I do make a point of trying to write a lot frequently, um, probably too much. Um, it's just part of a habit. I suppose, yeah, I suppose I had underrated the value of practice in writing because um, I think probably you can see, as Michelle saying, over the last 10 years, I've been publishing <coughs> stuff on a blog and I go back now 10 years ago to some stuff I wrote and I think, oh God, that was terrible. Um, so as much as I haven't really noticed it, I think the sheer quantity of what I've written has has taken me forward a bit. I don't know. I hope, um, but I don't know. I just get a real buzz out of out of out of writing. So I always make time for it. I mean, this is your second book now because the Black Grouse was the first one, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. And you did so a that, lot of the illustrations in that book, didn't you? I did. Yeah. Um, that was obviously very artistic too. <laughs> that's kind of your point. Um, yeah, and I suppose it was interesting too because um, the temptation was there to offer some illustrations for this book. Um, and I just kind of shied away from it. I just, uh, it's very hard to do both. It's very hard to write and illustrate. Um, and I think probably what Berlin have done is find brilliant illustrators and brilliant designers to put together a book that I think is absolutely, fan it looks fantastic. Yeah, um, the end result is really lovely. It's a really beautiful book in the hand, you know, lovely paper and lovely illustrations at the top. Absolutely, end. yeah. So, but I wonder what I would have added to it. I suppose in that way, I wonder what I would have added to it. And I suppose also in a way, when I talk about practice in writing, um, <clears throat> I kind of make the choice about three or four years ago to say, you, you, you can't really finesse lots of things. You've got to really put all your all your effort behind one thing. So I suppose I picked writing and kind of, um, I haven't painted anything for, for probably 18 months, two years now. Um, I miss it a bit, but I suppose I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased to have made progress elsewhere. I think um, it's important. I tell you, we haven't really raised the subject of the Riggett Galloway. And I think you need to tell everybody about Riggett's because um, you've had people ask you about, you know, whether they're just another belted Galloway. And of course, they are certainly not. So would you like to explain a bit more about the Galloway and the Riggett Galloway and the belted Galloway? Absolutely. I think, um, I think Riggits are just the best. I think they're incredibly, aesthetically, they're, they're absolutely stunning. I think they're really, really beautiful animals. Um, I, I find it kind of fascinating that uh, their origins are really, really ancient. They come from um, the very, very sort of start of Galloway cattle um, as a breed. Um, Belted Galloways are extremely famous and they've covered a lot of ground and they've got a huge global um, following all the way across the world. Um, I rather liked the idea of Riggett's being a little bit more obscure and a little bit less known. Um, <clears throat> so the Riggett markings themselves, it gets to be a very convoluted, difficult, tricky story and everybody's got a different take on it. And I suppose in the book I had to take, I had to just choose one and go with it. Um, but I, I'm ready to be gainsayed. In fact, I've already been gainsayed by a couple of people who said, oh, no, that's not where they came from. Um, <laughs> the, re the reality is that uh, this, it's classic, Polly. Um, the best time to write a book ab about any subject is about six months after you've written a book about that subject because yeah, you definitely. immediately get 100 <laughs> people turn up and say, ah, oh, bollocks, so, no, you need to. So, so I probably learned more about riggets and curlews over the last fortnight since the book came out than I ever did before the book came out. But 
Um, Did you have people, I mean, you probably haven't yet, but you get the people who ring up and say, I, um, I just want to tell you that on page 46, you've got a mistake there or something is, you know, yeah, they it's, it's, seem to sit there and go through and find a fact that you've got that's wrong. And it, it's, it's quite interesting and it's, it's quite off-putting at times. No, why, uh, that was funny. Somebody got in touch the other day and said, oh, there's a spelling mistake on page 70, whatever. Oh. And I thought, well, okay, okay I, can't, I can't do anything about that. Uh, are you enjoying the book? Otherwise, has it spoiled the book? <laughs> Um, I don't know, uh, but he then he was it, 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 that was that was quite funny. But um, I suppose um, the rigget um, back to the rigget um, stuff. I suppose what's really revealing is there's a there's a really nice old watercolor painting of um, what's described as a Galloway heifer, um, which was sent to Smithfield Market uh, sort of Regency period, start of the 1800s, um, and it's a rigget Galloway. Um, and you can argue back and forth about why or what that animal was, but it's a black animal with a white stripe down its back. It's got white patches on its face. It's got white legs. It's very clearly what I would know as being a rigget Galloway, and yet it's being described as a Galloway. Um, and I think probably during the Victorian era, when we started to take breeding livestock much more seriously, there was a real, real need for uniformity. People got really interested in making things really consistent. Um, and Rigget Galloways just aren't consistent. Uh, as you said earlier, I'm going to be carving in uh, a fortnight's time. Uh, I don't know what on earth I'm going to get. I've crossed a pedigree Rigget bull with my pedigree Rigget heifers. Um, I could get a black calf. I could get a Rigget calf. I could get a white calf. Uh, some of my heifers have got red bloodlines in them, so that I could get a red calf. I could get a red Rigget calf. Uh, you absolutely don't know. And I think that's one of the things that, that appeals when I've spoken to a friend, I've got a friend in the borders who breeds pedigree Herefords. And I have to say, I don't know how you can, this is, must be just so boring for you. You know, even before the bull goes out, you know, you know what you're getting. Um, but um, generally it seems that rigets just weren't really approved of because they're quite irregular, because you don't really know where they're coming from. Um, they they're were very clean. ancient breed, aren't they? I mean, it's a really, and really old breed. They've got they're very old fashioned. And what's, what's interesting, I think probably in, in, to, to cut loads of corners on this, is that um, when you look at um, in some of the Irish breeds look very like Rigget Galloways. Um, some of the so very rare breeds in Ireland look exactly like Rigget Galloways. There was a huge sort of transfusion of Irish livestock into Scotland around the time of the Union of the Crowns, um, 1707. Um, where people in Galloway suddenly said, right, we're going to make a big fist of doing cattle. Cattle are the direction of travel here. Um, it'd be interesting to trace it right back and see maybe that's originally where they came from. Um, but what's really interesting, I, what tickles me about Riggets is that they just pop up here, there and everywhere. So you can cross two black Galloways, you can cross two belted Galloways and out of nowhere, lightning seems to strike. Every now and again, you get this throwback. Um, and that's kind of, by my understanding, how Riggets kind of rose back into prominence again. But the genes are very, very recessive. The Riggett genes are very recessive. Um, so if you've got a Riggett calf, you can be quite sure that you're dealing with very old bloodlines, very unimproved bloodlines, very, very traditional stock. So in some ways, if I get a black calf, I can labor on about this, but if I get a black calf, it's still a rigget, but it, because of both of its parents were riggets, it means you're dealing with the kind of animal that would have been quite familiar 250, 300 years ago, the real, the, the, the really, the real sort of primal cattle from which lots of others came. So um, there's lots of reasons why riggets, aside from anything, they just look fantastic. They look so smart. As much as people get very excited about belted galloways, I think riggets stand head and shoulders above them. And also, I would say, paying food bills, paying to keep them. Rigget galloways are a lot thriftier. Um, I, I reckon that I've got a couple of belted galloways. They eat and put away an awful lot more, and they get hungrier far faster than riggets. Riggets, um, but I find they might be smaller, um, and they might be slower than belted galloways, but they're a great deal cheaper. Uh, the reason why sometimes people ask me why I keep Rigget Galloways, I can't really afford to keep any other breed. They're, they are very, very low cost, very low input animals. Um, it, um, Patrick, Adrian Turpin has sent you a message. I have to say your book is exceptional. One of the best things I have read without exception for a while. You talked earlier about the curlew coming to symbolize more than you'd initially thought. And we can say the same about the Rigget. What do you think yeah. these animals do end up representing in this book? I think think as much as little as I had intended it to head this way um, the two species to me began to represent um, the curlew seemed to say an awful lot about our relationship with the countryside and an awful lot about what we expected land to provide us 
um, and Rigget's in a way become almost like a, a human being avatar, it's like a real uh, sort of like the cultural representation of an area. So um, the way that the two lock together in the book, I hope, um, is 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 interesting, um, and also to the way that they have both faded away. Um, says I think quite a lot about, or I hope quite a lot about um, the countryside and, and and particularly this part of the country. So so yeah, I think they probably went. Uh, they probably started when I was first drafting this. They started out as being um, just cows and birds, and latterly they became an awful lot more than that. Yes, but do you worry about the future of the rigget? Do you think you're one of the last sort of rigget keepers? No, I think I think riggets have got quite a nice future ahead of them. Um, I think it's been interesting, even since writing the book, that people have been in touch to say, tell me more about riggets. Um, I'm probably the least qualified person to tell anybody about riggets, um, but um, they are definitely very striking, very attractive, and very, yeah, we must, can't labour the point, but um, yeah, low input animals. So um, as we, as the world of agriculture start to shift away from maybe some of the um, issues associated with intensive farming, um, Riggets are a lot more viable option, a lot more interesting option commercially uh, than they've probably ever been. And, and actually the Riggett Galloway Cattle Society, I see photographs being posted all the time from new members, um, Riggets popping up all over the place. I think things look quite nice for them. That's really good. Do you think that the current situation is going to make people think more about getting food locally, about, you know, not, not buying these imports do you think it's going to change the way people shop or do you think it's all about cheap food how, how do you see that going ahead i'm really i'm really keen not to put myself forward as as a as a, a sort of an authoritative voice in this whole argument but at the same time i i have to I have to say that as local food, local provenance with a bit of culture and a bit of history around it is inherently a more attractive pro product. Uh, I don't, I, I'm worried sometimes that it's a bit of a niche project product and a bit of a luxury product, but I suppose at the same time, if we um, work on the basis of lots of scientific evidence coming out at the moment, we should be eating less but better meat and working on the basis that if we if an animal's going to die to put food on the plate it should be the best animal from the best place and the most sustainably produced animal i subscribe to that um that that view of things um and i like to think that in a little way talking about riggets and talking about the huge benefits they can do for conservation um yeah i might just be part of that conversation if not if not guiding it contributing to that conversation I mean, when you compare a rigget to something like a big charolais or a cemental or, a, um, you know, that's they have so much less impact on the ground. And in your book, you talk a lot about the importance of the impact of animals on the particular ground, especially in such a sensitive place as the area where you are. Um, you also raise the subject of commercial forestry. And I personally would love to talk to you and for everybody to bring in questions about views on commercial forestry because you're seeing huge changes in Galloway and I know Anne Brown is in the audience here too today and I think Anne would probably have questions about this because she knows the area very well um, as well. So can you tell us about the impact you've seen of that on the very sensitive landscape where you live? Uh, <clears throat> I um, have had a couple of bruising conversations recently along these lines um, and I think probably I find it helpful to draw a line between a lot of the work I do um, in terms of conservation of birds that really don't like uh, that kind of um, that kind of environment that 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 commercial forestry uh, the hu huge creation of commercial forestry which has happened here the last 50 60 years I suppose probably in the book I've tried to park that a bit as much as I can and really just look instead in really just accept that it's happened and in many ways is going to continue to happen. We're getting it whether we like it or not. And really then just try and focus on what it's like to live alongside it and, and, and not necessarily make peace with it because um, I, I, I refute big, uh, big parts of the credo around why we're doing this. But really just to say, Here's an area with really quite a quite a specific, quite a clear idea of itself. Um, let's basically completely revise it. Let's completely renew it, overhaul it, turn it upside down, and kind of deal more with the fallout rather than the specific issue. But I suppose 
in Galloway, we 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 have seen. I had a visitor, uh, a friend from Bristol came to visit recently, um, and she had heard an awful lot about commercial deforestation, uh, particularly with regards to curlews. Um, and it's a huge issue in Ireland. So a lot of people in Ireland are quite concerned about the knock on effects of, of planting enormous areas of moorland and putting them under 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 trees. Um, I took her to the highest point on our piece of ground uh, and I was able to show her probably 25, 30 square miles of commercial forestry, which is small compared to what we've had in Galloway. We've had upwards of 500 square miles put, brought to Galloway in the last um, 50, 60 years. Um, and she was absolutely staggered. She couldn't believe it. She said, until you see it at first hand, it's really quite difficult to get your head around. Now, I know and I understand all the arguments which have got us here, but I suppose probably what the book tries to do is 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 kind of say where do we go where do we go next and in many ways the new this new industry this new full steam ahead approach to creating commercial forests is going to happen it's going to keep on happening and a big part of me wanted to write the book to effectively say we've had this change this massive groundswell change this unbelievable change really just trying to mark not to not to beg for it to be restored i'm quite keen that the book isn't taken as a as a, a sort of a, a campaign point just to mark what was there before it because i think quite often when we're told environmental arguments which i query economic arguments uh, there's lots of motivations for why what's happened has happened but i think um we also need to accept the fact that what has happened has also wiped an entirely functioning culture and heritage just absolutely off the map and when it comes to um, when it comes to where we go next, we're looking at 12,000 hectares of new forest being created in Scotland every year in order to meet government targets. It's an area the size of Manchester. Um, we, we really are going full steam ahead. As you said earlier, even in the time that um, the book's been written and then lay with the publishers, um, two of the places that are described in the book have gone under trees. So this is an incredibly dynamic, happening right now issue. Um, and I think probably that was, that was yeah. something that was great. I've got Anne Brown here, and she's always had a terrible problem with the blanket growth of trees across Galloway. And she says it changes or obliterates the natural shapes of the land. Anne, I don't know if um, you're able to ask Patrick anything about this or comment, because I know that you're particularly passionate about the area and know it well. So if you feel like speaking to Patrick, please um, let us know and you can speak directly. Um, yeah, it's it's very, very worrying. And I think that in your book, what I loved about it was you, you don't romanticize things and you don't make it a campaign, but you just tell it how it is. And I found that honesty, sometimes brutal honesty, um, very, very, it's very touching and makes the book incredibly real and authentic uh, i think you know that's very much to its credit um another thing i'd like to ask you is how might the current crisis um and in particular the experience of lockdown change a reader of natives experience how can our experience of the natural world anchor us during and after this pandemic i mean you're seeing people posting about nature all the time at the moment do you think these people um, who probably had nothing to do with nature before, if you don't mind me saying, do you think they'll stick with it? Or do you think after this is all over, say two years down the line, they'll forget about the natural world and its importance? Big question. I think this is, this is a, a, a really interesting sort of watershed moment for, for our relationship with the natural world more generally. Suddenly not being allowed to go outside is, a, is yeah, quite a, quite a cornerstone. Um, it's been interesting. Um, I'm, as I said earlier, involved with the Nature Friendly Farming Network. There was an interesting thread <laughs> went around the group recently that um, said, should we as farmers continue posting uh, photographs of our livestock and the wildlife we see in the countryside? Because aside from anything, it seems almost like we're gloating. We're almost sort of rubbing it in. Look, life for us goes on as normal. Um, and I think probably that was a, that was a point I hadn't necessarily grasped. Um, it's it's been really interesting. There's been it's certainly been a huge upsurge in 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 wildlife in the countryside, and I suppose if we can take this as a as a an opportunity to recalibrate, then that's all for the better. Yeah, I think it really is. Now, somebody has uh, Bridget here, and she says, "Can you please tell us a bit more about seeing those pine martens on the forest <laughs> track at the end of March? That was a most amazing eureka moment, and I love that video. So Absolutely, can you tell everybody about that. 
I can't. I, I, it was an extraordinary moment. Um, quite happily um, parked up in my truck, taking in the view, and um, there. Uh, this is an old defunct railway line, um, so it has very few bends and corners in it. You can see right the way down the length of it, and I saw what appeared to be uh, either a bird or a shadow or something very small flickering off in the distance. And it would probably be seven, eight hundred yards away, and I got binoc had time to put down my coffee, had time to find my binoculars, and I thought, oh, look at that, it's an otter running towards me. Um, and then the otter became two otters. And I thought, well, there's something odd happening here. And at about 500 yards, they continued to sprint towards me. Um, about 500 yards, I suddenly thought, oh my God, it's pine martins. And so I then had time to put down my binoculars gently, uh, stretch luxuriously, uh, reach for my camera, <laughs> and I managed to get a um, video of them coming closer and closer and closer and closer. And it's quite funny, they're so hell-bent on chasing one another um, that they don't even seem to notice the car. So they ran straight in underneath the car and had a huge fight under the car. There was lots of screeching and scrabbling and dust <laughs> flying everywhere. And then, as if somebody had flicked a switch, they then ran away again. And then I then sat and watched them for about three or four minutes running away again. Um, I posted the video on the internet and it was seen by like 150,000 people um, saw it. And <laughs> nobody, nobody could quite believe um, what I had seen. I suppose also in relation to your um, coronavirus um, point it was interesting a few people had said oh well it's nature restoring itself because there's no people in the countryside um, nature's becoming more bold and, and and wildlife that you'd never normally see is coming out and about and being more conspicuous um yeah i've seen some evidence of that but um not with those pine martins because for a start that's a place where nobody ever goes full stop but also they ran out of a forest which at that second was undergoing being clear felled so that forest was probably busier than it's been in the last 20 years um and so I think probably a few people who know more about pine martins, including you, Polly, people who know more about pine martins than I do, had reckoned it was a, it was a, a mature male chasing off a, a young male. But it was my first encounter with pine martins. And, and they it's shot a pretty good me. first encounter. Bloody you right. You even had a cup of coffee in your hand. I couldn't believe it. I mean, talk yeah, about jamming. They, they went, I've been admiring them from afar for years. I never thought that I would get to get such a, you really, as they ran past, you could have reached down and touched them if you had had a, if you had a leather gauntlet or... or, or. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. Now, we've got a comment here from Marsha who says, um, this is sort of going back to what we were just talking about, the world needed a rest from people. Animals are roaming, are roaming around and I hope at last that we appreciate the earth. It, today is Earth Day in USA. So that's a sort of thought-provoking comment. Yeah. Now, I've also had Alan Smith, and he's asked if any of your cattle have, any, have, have gone into the food chain yet, and if so, have they gone to specialist outlets? If so, who and where? Now's your big moment to be promoting <laughs> Rigget Galloway's. It's, it's one of the themes in the book that <laughs> um, hill management, upland management, is dependent on very, very slow processes. And it was one of the things that was drummed into me quite early on is that in hill farming and in land management in the uplands, you have to pick a thread and stick with it. And you can't, you can't chase the trend. You can't chase the fashion. You can't ditch stuff and move on to other things, which you think, oh, there might be money in that just shortly. Um, you have to sink in and ride the ups and downs with it. And so here I am seven, six and a half, seven years into this project. And no, I still haven't, I still haven't got anything yet to, no, to but it'll come okay. now we've got a thorny one has just come up here Anne without an e and it's pine martens have been introduced by the forestry commission but they're killing the red squirrels any views well i've certainly got some but you said you must have them too <laughs> absolutely um we hear lots of stuff about pine martens and red squirrels um we've got really fragile population of red squirrels here we've had gray squirrels coming through recently and i know that there's been research into um pine martins killing more red more gray squirrels than red squirrels and thereby helping red squirrels um i probably take the view that in a uh, i think there's a there is there is space for both of them uh and um i i think if you get a chance to to get see a pine it's, it's that I'm, i can't overemphasize how seeing those pine martins up close kind of transformed my understanding of them so having been trained as a uh a keeper part of me was always slightly suspicious about pine martins um but i probably i must say enjoyed seeing the pine martins as much if not more than the red squirrels so um i think that we 
it's unfair generally to expect nature to find a balance and i think we need to keep an eye on it but i can't see why um there isn't space for there isn't space for, for both of them i think if they do we've also got here a lot of goshawks in galloway um and goshawks um kill an awful lot of gray squirrels, red squirrels but they also they kill red, red, also kill red squirrels too um so there's lots of interesting stuff going on here but never let it be said that i don't take red squirrel conservation very seriously and i and i'm very fond of our squirrels and very proud of very proud to be living in one of the few places in britain that's still got any red squirrels so yeah. um yeah we're very lucky here because we have um, red squirrels and pine martens and sometimes we've had both in the garden at the same time oh. and neither take really much notice of the other so um, that's quite interesting and we haven't oh. seen any impact on our red squirrel population since we've had quite a high population of pine martens oh. um, but you know I mean that people do pine martens do have a bad reputation and they are little devils but um red squirrels will also eat baby blackbirds and various other fledglings so it's important to kind of remember it all i suppose um we've got a friend in galloway from uh, used to have loads of red squirrels at the feeder even a year ago now it's just pine martens so that's interesting um you have had the red squirrel pox in um galloway haven't you very locally yeah last year we had um uh very ill squirrels which were sent off and tested and found to have the pox um and right. since then i must say i haven't seen red squirrels in that particular area so um yeah it's 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 scary times and i suppose probably i it's been interesting we've all been saying in galloway oh god the red squirrels days are numbered that's pretty much the end of them uh, gray squirrels are on their way neither at eagles field neither at anna neither at gretna they're on their way they're on the march the march happens it seems like the front line of that battle in a way has kind of stalled. It seemed for a long time to have kind of stalled in this and they never really, so lots of outriders crop up in strange places in Galloway from now and, again, now and then, but we haven't yet seen that complete sort of overhaul of red squirrels into gray squirrels. Um, and part of me thinks maybe pine martins have got something to do with it. Maybe goshawks have got something to do with it. Also the fact that um, gray squirrels probably find an awful lot less to do in, in enormous, um, um, spruce plantations and, and red squirrels can skip through them so yeah um, we've got another question here Patrick what are your lockdown reading recommendations for us <laughs> that's from either um, I am working through stacks of stuff at the moment um, I like Annie Prue probably yeah, more you... than any more than any other your living favorite. writer yeah, mm -hmm. so um, I'm working through a lot of Annie Prue at the moment and finding that just, just absolutely fantastic. Um, particularly for, I think she has guided along with lots of others the kind of writing I'd like to do, which is um, kind of fearless, fearless, kind of brutal portrayals of life in the countryside. Some of the stuff that I've just finished uh, Annie Prue's book, Postcards, um, for, on a second reading, uh, there's bits in that that's, I think, some of the most exciting far more exciting far more engaging far more relatable stuff in that than there is in you said at the start nature writing and, and, and a nature book i don't i always kind of wince when i hear that expression um i find an awful lot more to take from um from that kind of writing um than i would from many perhaps some of the more famous celebrated nature writers who are working today yes i know and sometimes um well, I'm not, no, I think we won't, uh, yeah, it's very difficult. Sometimes you wonder why, I sometimes think, well, wonder why that book does well and then another one doesn't. I think a lot of it's about the airplay it gets. Um, and I certainly think yours is going to definitely hit the big time. I think it's going to be for a much wider audience than Galloway. What I feel about it is it's got a message and a wonderful story. Now there's also a very personal story um, running through it too. You have a um, feeling about, you, you had a strong feeling throughout the book about heredity. Do you want to talk a little bit about that, about the importance of heredity? Yeah, it is. Uh, um, I suppose probably I'd always been very aware of um, the people around me and kind of picking up the reins on a tradition and feeling that, that, that what I was taking on was effectively the work of hundreds and hundreds of people who'd gone before me. And I suppose that's quite an onerous burden to lift. Um, so that had always been really, the more I think about it, the more I think that's been pressing on me for years without me even realizing it. Um, 
And then when it came to be passing um, the reins on or looking to be passing the reins on to the next generation, it was a, it was a bit of a, a, a wake up call to find that that wasn't necessarily something that was immediately going to happen for, 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 for me and my wife. So um, yeah, I suppose that was, um, I hadn't necessarily meant to include that in the book, but as soon as I started to, it seemed to make a huge amount of sense to me. And in a way too, I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was pissed off because I was working with cattle on a really, really awful day. And I thought um, issues to do with um, fertility treatments and IVF treatments. Um, um, it was weighing really heavily on me and I was working with the cows and I thought, well, they don't, they wouldn't give a damn about this kind of thing. And I drew an awful lot of sort of, sort of stubborn refusal just to, to bury it because it's such a taboo subject. It's such a, it's such an issue. People just skip over people avoid. It's, it's a really difficult issue to bring up even with, even with friends and family. Um, and I suppose, um, I took a lot from them and I just suddenly thought, bugger it. Why is this something that, that we can't talk about? Because yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a horrible process. It's something that's really difficult trying, um, hard piece of work to go through, but at the same time, I suppose it was linked back to having received an awful lot from my parents and then kind of then my, my parents, their parents, their parents, um, and then kind of thinking, well, this all seems to sort of link together. This is at the, we're almost at the end of the line here. So I suppose probably that's how it found its way into the book as it did was because it, it was, yeah, it was, it was a, it was a, it felt like an ending in lots of ways. There's a very moving thread through the book and I thought it was very cleverly woven in and the fact that you dealt with it so well and you know you didn't make big issues of it you just described it as it was and I just found the sort of juxtaposition between you being out with the beasts and the, the cattle you're finding it very easy to get the cows in calf but things were not kind of quite the same at home and I found that very strong you also had a bit of black humor in it too and I, yeah. I, I think a lot of people will relate to that because as you said to me yesterday when we were having an informal chat you know amazing number of people have gone through this and you know one of the funniest things is that people hate talking about it but why should we why should it be a taboo subject absolutely yeah no and and it's I suppose probably it's one of the things that came into the book is is um what if you're unable to talk about it, then you feel frustrated, but um, it's difficult to really know what you do want to talk about because I, I, I'm still sort of at a loss to work out how you support someone through that extremely shit process. I'm still, I'm still, I don't really know what people could have said or done to help, but I suppose I was just cross that. Um, it, I couldn't initiate the conversation because it was almost like, oh, it almost felt like the, 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 that it was kind of off limits. Um, and as I say, looking at the cows, working with the cows, I suddenly thought, well, yeah, I suppose that also came out for a few other issues in the book, working with the cows. I thought, well, they don't give a damn. Why, why should I? Now, I would just like to give everybody the chance again, if anybody would like to speak to Patrick direct, please um, either just type a quick, quick message just with question. Uh, don't write the question, just put the word question or uh, stick your hand up and um, we will get to you because it seems that Patrick and I have been chatting and nobody else has had much chance. So please feel free to do that. In the meantime, I want to go over this again to reiterate that it is really a very outstanding book. And I think Patrick should be incredibly proud of this as a first. I mean, I know you did the, the um, Black Grouse book first, but this is this is something really it's so multifaceted. I just loved it. I love everything about it. It's going to be, you know, one of my desert island books, I think, because I can relate to so much. But I also love Galloway. And I think for Wigton Book Festival, you know, it's, it's a fabulous book for us at Wigton because it, it describes such a beautiful area um, and a place we all love. But it is going to um, hit chords all over the world, I think. It's, it should have a very wide audience. I was very, very um, pleased, Polly, when I found that you were going to be interviewing me. I was very thrilled. This could have been a very different experience. I'm very glad you liked it. No, it might. Gone. It still could. We're still on air. Now, we've got <laughs> Gillian. You mentioned at the start that everything has changed since you wrote the book. Now that the farm has changed and you're a parent, ah, she's, she's uh, given away the end of the book. Have you thought about writing a sequel? Um... <clears throat> No, um, I think probably the book was an incredibly 
demanding experience. It, 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 particularly the last 10 days. So the entire book was pretty much rewritten in the last 10 days before it was handed to the publishers. Um, and that was a very, very exciting, but very draining experience. Um, I, 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 I think about it being, I think about it visually. I had um, a start being like a, like a, like a, a bookend and the finish being like a bookend. And as soon as I had the start and the finish together, I was able to fire ricochet bits and pieces back and forth and then really stitch the whole thing together. Um, how successful I've been with that is, is, is up to the reader, but that was very, very exciting. And in a way, I, I wonder now about writing another book, how on earth I could ever get back to that state again. A big part of me thinks I've, 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 I've said what I felt was really important and I'm sort of done now. I always. Um, I think rather... it's quite a hard act to follow because it's it's it's, and I think it's yeah. Well, I don't know. We we shall see. I I still write stacks all the time, but it's very disjointed. Oh, bits, little, little bits and stories and jokes and ideas and um. So I can't. I'm still writing almost constantly, but it was. I suppose probably I was looking to write something like Native for a very long time, and then suddenly I found a box to put it in to make it a book and it all the little bits and pieces and fragments came together in that book um how i do that again or if i want to do that again i don't i don't know i as i say i think there's probably something to be said for being done and and sitting quietly for a while now we've got a couple more questions here and then i think we're going to wrap things up we've got a, a, a lovely comment from marcia who says i love your accent not mine i live in florida but it's a definite New York City accent that I have. I think that's a very charming comment. We've also got from Masha again, will the new book be sold on amazon.com? And yes, I think it will be. Um, I think it is available there, but um, I don't know where else she can get it. It's a pity she can't get it from Wigton Book Festival, but obviously that's probably more difficult. We've got um, quite a long question here, which might take you quite a lot of answering, but it's from Michelle Werrett on Exmoor. It's clear that shooting, if it happens at all, will be some fairly curtailed next season because of COVID-19. What impact do you think reduced keeper activity might have on moorlands and wildlife in your area? Um, oh, sorry, can I just interrupt? Kenny Barr has just come in here and he says to Marsha, yes, you can get it. It is available on the Wigton Book um, Festival website, www.wigtonbookfestival.com. So that's for you, Marsha. Okay, sorry, Patrick, no. back to that question. Um, so, uh, it's hard because to, from my perspective, shooting falls into two halves. It falls into an upland half, which is the management of wild game birds like grouse and a lowland half, which is released birds like pheasants and partridges. Um, a lot of the upland shooting in Galloway is more or less defunct anyway, um, which, um, you can make of what you will. Uh, it's, it's easier to see now in terms of lowland shooting, how, what the impact's going to be in terms of. Um, people getting invested in birds now that they need to buy and bring in. Um, I don't know. It's probably rather a big question. Uh, a lot of the people I think probably who are doing standard gamekeeping stuff are probably still just doing it anyway, because it's their job. It's what they're expected to do. So um, yeah, but I think that's probably quite an important thing to say that the upland lowland divide because um, yeah, curlews overlap into into aspects of um, gamekeeping and predator control quite a lot. So yeah, it is a, it's a relevant question. We should have started that at the beginning because we could talk about that for a long time. Now there's a few things. I think I'm going to wrap this up now. So before I do that, I just want to remind everybody that we can you can buy the book directly from the Wigton Festival Bookshop and the link is here now for you to look at. If not, it's on the website um, and they will post the book out to you. So that's not a problem at all. And I also want to remind you that this time next week, seven o'clock, Wigton Wednesdays, uh, Wigton stalwart Robert Twigger, who's um, a writer, travel writer, adventurer, and um, somebody we all love at Wigton Book Festival, will be talking about his book, Walking the Stones. So that's the same time, the same place next week. So don't forget that. And I'd like to thank everybody for um, being patient with us tonight. Um, Highland Perthshire and rural Galloway 
broadband has held out quite well. I think there's only been a few little minor um, hiccups. But anyway, I'd like to give Patrick an enormous um, round of applause and thank him enormously for being so patient. And also, I'd like to urge you all, please, to uh, buy this book. You will not be disappointed. It's fabulous. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you, Polly. Thank you, everybody. That's brilliant.